Here we go. Um, so this is uh, porting Drupal, or the WS Data module to Drupal 8, and a case study in porting it to Drupal 8. So hello, my name's David Pascodelari. I'm the CTO of Coldfront Labs, and I'm spot zero on Drupal.org. So a bit more about me and this topic. Uh, I help maintain a lot of modules on Drupal.org. Uh, this is my Drupal.org project page, which is a little bit ridiculous. Um, <laughs> the latest one I'm maintaining now is a uh, ZND reference that you probably all use. But one of the modules I maintain is WS Data. And that's the one we're going to be talking about. So, what is the WS Data module? You probably haven't heard of it unless you've had a very, very specific uh, use case where you needed it. Um, so, what's the problem that this module tries to solve? Um, when, most of the work that we get asked to do uh, it usually involves integrating uh, Drupal content or Dru content managed in Drupal with external resources and data, uh, usually via web services. So, there's a lot of using Drupal as a portal to a bunch of resources, or uh, Drupal loading supplemental data about some item that is also managed in Drupal. Um, and there are solutions for dealing with these sorts of problems in Drupal, but almost all of them um, are, are basically, their implementation is you point something at your data source, and then you slurp it all down into Drupal's database, uh, and then you, that's how you interact with it. It now becomes Drupal content and Drupal claims authority for it. So you can integrate it and then all the lovely Drupal things like views uh, start working on it. But doing things that way gives you, a, or gives you a huge problem, which is how do you keep this data in sync? So uh, when we were looking at this problem, we quickly discovered that syncing is bad. Syncing is a really hard problem, and there's no real good way to, to solve it once you get into the situation where you have data that needs to be synced from a remote uh, resource. The real problem with syncing is that you are claiming authority for data that is not yours. You are not authoritative for it, but because you're, impo you're importing it into your database, um, you're saying to Drupal that this is mine. I'm the authoritative for the source of this data. Um, and then you have the problem of how do you keep that in sync when it's somebody else's data that you're using, but Drupal thinks it's not, it, that it belongs to you. So, the solution, or at least that we found, uh, WS Data started as an experiment to see if this would even work, and it turns out it does, is uh, what if web services are actually fast enough that you could use them as the data source and just load them um, and keep uh, your remote content remote and let whoever is authoritative for that data just remain authoritative. Uh, that gives you a new problem. Uh, it means you need to somehow give Drupal an interface where it can understand how to make dynamic calls to various web services to load different data. And this, so you need a system that standardizes and abstracts general web services so that they can be called dynamically by Drupal through various interfaces. So that's what WS Data tries to do. Uh, WS Data gives you Drupal uh, a standard way to communicate with web services. Um, you can have all kinds of different web services and different backends, and it gives one common interface for calling those web services, uh, and then lets you build integration points built on that. Um, the sort of side benefits that it also provides is it lets you, it gives you a nice interface to manage web service endpoints. Uh, a lot, uh, when you're writing integration with web services, you have a tendency to see a lot of hard-coded endpoints in, in various code. This is where this resource is. Uh, this gets really problematic if you have different endpoints for different environments. So you have your dev endpoints and your dev interface and your QA endpoints and your QA site, your prod endpoints somewhere else, and then you try and export those and then you accidentally point to prod and dev. Um, 
So putting it in code is the general solution, but has problems. WSData ends up giving you an interface which sort of solves this. Um, it lets you export web or the configurations for your uh, web services into features, um, which lets you sort of manage the configuration. Uh, and it also gives developers uh, a simplified API for making web service calls, where gen things are generally handled for you, like air handling, so you don't have to write all that. Um, because WSA was sort of written uh, as an experiment that then worked and then was sort of developed into a full featured set of thing, or a set of or full featured module that did all kinds of things, uh, the, the architecture for it is a bit is a bit interesting as well as our nomenclature for for uh, the various components. But this is essentially uh, the architecture we went with. We have. It also um, revolves around how Drupal 7 entities look. Uh, we had an entity type called uh, WS config, because they're storing web service config. Um, and the bundle for that was WS config types, so the configuration types. Those would store specifics about the actual source of your data. So is this going to be a REST interface, or what? how do you actually talk to it? what the base endpoint is, um, caching support on, on that, and, and language support that that, um, that endpoint has, um, and, and whether it's up or down or not. Um, then below that, you have the WSFIGs, which have the individual configurations for that web service, so talking to specific services hosted by that WSFIG type. Um, and then those would, when you make a call to a W, so you could essentially load your WS config, and then make a call to it, and then it would make a call through the connector, which was the actual implementation that spoke sort of REST, or just made an HTTP call. Um, and then that WS connector could be put around any kind of web server, or web client library, to, and that's how that abstraction occurred. And then we had a concept for a WS processor which did the decoding of the response. So it would take JSON or XML and turn it into structured data that you just get back so that you don't have to care about it. So we'll, uh, we can take a look at it. We'll do a quick live demo uh, to show you what that ended up looking like. Um, yay. All right, so uh, let's make this a little bit bigger so that you can actually see it. It's just a, a Drupal 7 site with WS data enabled. Uh, you have your web service configuration type. I have, let me pull this out of the oven. Uh, I've pre-configured this one. It's Wikipedia. So the base endpoint for the web service is wikipedia slash w, which is their web service endpoint. Um, it uses our REST client connector to get data from it. It doesn't do any kind of language handling. We have language handling plugins, so it could either change the URL that it calls in different languages, or have other ones that, part, that parse the output differently to get different languages. Once we have this, um, we can add a web service configuration, so we have a specific method that we're calling from Wikipedia, which is Wikipedia read. So uh, we have a read data method, which is this. It's kind of a mess because of how the Wikipedia web services work. Everything is at api.php, and then you give it arguments. Um, what we have here is in the arguments, there is an argument called page, which takes a title, and so we have a replacement token in there for title, and then that will actually be the argument that calls it. So there's no actually no other configuration here we need it, but we have cache settings, so we can override um, how we're going to cache the results of this. Uh, we can also test it. So here we get to put in the replacements that we want, so we can say Drupal, replace title with Drupal, and then make a test call. And here we got back some XML from Wikipedia. 
Then for what I was talking about before, in turn, now that because we had this is a generalized interface for Drupal to call, um, we can write a whole bunch of extensions that you just sort of set up your endpoints and then those extensions can talk to them to load web service data. Uh, and one of the things that we've implemented in WS Data is a field storage controller. So instead of storing field data in a database, you can define a field, a field in Drupal, but tell, but tell Drupal, no, this isn't stored in the database, this is stored in a web service. So you actually don't have any tables for this field. Um, so you can set up a field like that. Uh, here we have one attached to nodes. The field is just called link data. Um, and it uses the XML pro pro processor to get that data. Inside it, we're sort of blowing through how all this works. Uh, the remote data key is the data that we want to extract from the payload to, uh, to get, the, to get the, the actual value we want. Um, and then how do we get, how do we replace the token? We use the title property of the node and we use that to actually call the web service. So in the end, what this does is when a node is loaded, it'll take the title of that node um, and then populate, whenever that node is loaded, it will populate the value of the linked data field with the result of this web service. So if we go to content, add content, uh, and the linked data content, we could say, uh, I already have one called Drupal. But, uh, WordPress. WordPress. All right, WordPress. <laughs> Spell it wrong. WordPress. I haven't tested WordPress, so hopefully it works. So we save it. And so here's the WordPress page. Yes. Redirect. Miscapitalization. Well, that's sort of boring content. Content. Let's uh, let's fix that. Let's change that title. There we go. Now it's now the content is WordPress. It's all loaded dynamically when you load the node. So um, using that interface, you can connect it in all kinds of interesting ways. So that's what WS Data and D7 mostly does. Let's go back and do it. All right. So. Um, I guess I should talk about this soon. This presentation is, to me, um, almost like the unofficial tribute sequel to a presentation I saw that uh, at the last Drupal North in Montreal that Adam Bernstein gave. Uh, and he gave a presentation on how to, how to migrate modules to port modules to Drupal 8. Um, and his advice was essentially was not just that you have to restart from scratch, which you do because the API is so different, but you have to not even restart further than that. Not even restart it conceptually with the architecture because you still have to re-architect things before you even restart the code. You have to restart at the very beginning and, and restart with what is the goal of this module? Because Drupal 8 has changed so much, just changed so much from D7 that the entire goal of your module might not make sense anymore. And so you really have to go all the way back to basics and decide, does Drupal 8 need this feature? Because um, there's a chance it doesn't, and it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, so that's sort of what I did. Um, if we look at Drupal 8, uh, Drupal 8 actually comes much better equipped uh, for doing this sort of work than Drupal 7 does. Drupal 7 didn't really come with a good REST client, or a good HTTP client. You had Drupal HTTP request, everyone's used that function. It is, especially in the early versions of Drupal 7, pretty horribly limited, limited and, and handicapped as a way to make um, any kind of web service calls. It was good enough to go and get data, but anything other than that, if you, if you weren't the update module loading XML files from Drupal.org, it pretty much wasn't going to meet your needs. So in D7, you needed other libraries. Um, and if you do a search for modules that say REST client uh, on Drupal.org, you get a whole list of D7 modules that are nothing but API modules for making REST calls. Uh, Drupal 8 comes with Guzzle, which is a really great 
uh, HTTP client um, built into it. Uh, it's set up as a Drupal 8 service, so you just use dependency injection and then you get um, pretty much to the fact that standard PHP uh, HTTP client for, your, uh, for whatever you're building. Um, there's also, there's also comes with all kinds of other things that I get into that are really nice, but the big problem in D8 is the problem still exists that all these pieces um, still have to be assembled. Um, and it takes, there's a lot required to, if you're going to write some generalized code to call web services. Uh, so there's still a use case for WS data. One of the things I found while porting this is the default behavior of Guzzle is it will throw an exception on any HTTP result code um, that is an error. So uh, nothing is nothing's as ridiculous as getting an exception that ends your, your whole like Drupal site because Guzzle got a 404 from a file. So like it, it means that there, there is, like, if you're going to implement sort of REST functionality, like, you've got code to write, because at least you have to do exception handling. Um, so this, I guess, what I was talking about, do you really need a whole other module for this because it's better equipped? Uh, is this the same slide? Oh, all right. Let's move on then. <laughs> uh, one of the nice things, too, about Drupal 8, uh, is in WS Data 87, we actually, everything in all of our plugins are objects. Um, they, we can take a look at them, but we kind of had to write our own plugin system to make things easy. Uh, we set up a whole bunch of interfaces for like the WS connectors and WS parsers, which was the part of, that decoded the content, so that it was easy to extend your own and add your own in them. Uh, or add your own, so you could connect WS data to different things. I uh, really wanted to, we made it so we, we provided a core, and we wrote a little bit of glue code, and then you could talk to and parse whatever you needed. Uh, the, this actually made it really complicated for people to use, because we created our own plugin system, so we had to teach people how to use this plugin system. And it was object oriented, and nothing else in Drupal 7 was object oriented. Um, and so this is, was undoubtedly problematic. And there wasn't, there's no class auto loading, so you kind of always had to make sure that your classes were getting loaded some other way. Um, but Drupal 8 has a standard plugin system. So, the, so that is really easy to offer the exact same functionality. And we don't have to document it, because Drupal.org does. So porting, actually getting started into the work of bringing this thing to, to Drupal 8. So what were my goals to port this? Um, I wanted to make using WS Data easier to learn. I gave you a run through of the interface that sort of takes you end to end. Pretty much you could only do that if you knew what you were doing at that speed, because it is pretty complicated, way too complicated. Um, I wanted to make it easier to extend, which the plugin system does uh, nicely, but um, that was one of the big pain points in the issue queue. Anybody using this were like, well, I want to make a talk YAML. And so how do I do that? Well, you need to just implement one of these. It's like, okay, how do I do that? <laughs> um, so definitely want to make things easier to extend. Uh, we want to add more points where you could alter data flows. So certain people that really started using this module ended up being limited by it because they wanted to one last chance to alter their, their queries and things on the way out, um, just because they wanted to add things to it. Uh, somebody wanted to, to add in API keys to thing to like, to specific, WS, to, to specific WS config calls, like as they were leaving, but before another step. Um, and so that was, that was there, there wasn't an interface to do that in the V7 version, so I had more points. Uh, one of the things we wanted to get away from, because it was really confusing, is the custom terminology that we ended up implementing with WS configs and config types. There's not really a good, nobody, nobody would know what that did by the name. I mean, in sort of, you have to really explain every single step. Um, we kind of wanted to reduce the amount of boilerplate code you need to, uh, to actually use this. 
Um, and I'll show you what I sort of mean by that in another slide. Uh, and we definitely want to have more examples and tutorials and, and documentation so that it's, uh, it's easier to get up and running. So when it comes to uh, rename, so when it comes to renaming the components, basic renaming we did is WS config become a WS call. So you're actually making a web service call. The config types become a server, the server that you're making a call to. Uh, and then the WS parser became a, an ink or a decoder. But now we've got two points to encode on the way out and decode data on the way back. Uh, we re-architected things a bit to resolve some of the build, build system pain points to give you less to configure. Um, so there's still the two sort of items you have to configure, but on the WS server, you choose what connector you want to use, which is the implementation that should talk to your service, and then you configure WS call, and then that one you sort of choose your encoder, decoder, and what service you are or you want to connect to. Um, to sort of, and it sort of makes things a bit more straightforward. The other thing with coming up all these, with all these graphs is they make nice documentation. Uh, better development API. So here's an example of what code looks like to call um, WS8.87. Essentially what you're doing, the first line loads the configuration entity, and the second line calls it, which goes and makes a web service call and brings back some data. It's unprocessed though, so you have to load your processor um, and give the processor your data, that parses your data, and then you ask the processor for your parsed data, and it gives you, you know, your data structure that you want. Um, there's no sort of error handling in this code, but this is sort of the minimum boilerplate that you need. Uh, in D8, we sort of felt that you should be able to completely configure all of that. You didn't need that code. You're only going to parse the results of a web service call one way, or else you should make a second call that does something different. Um, so we could do the whole thing for you. So in D8, um, WS data is actually a service. Is that way good with what services are in Drupal 8? Yes? Wow, okay. You want to, I can talk about it if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do, do you want me to talk about what services are in Drupal 8? Oh, no, I know. You know? Okay, you know, okay, good. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, cool. So it's, it's a registered service, so you, would, you don't even need the first line generally. You would uh, you just say that WS data is a dependency, uh, and then you will get the, uh, the service via dependency injection. Uh, and then it becomes only one call. You just say WS data uh, on the service call, and then whatever your WS call name, machine name is, and it will give you back the parse data directly that you've configured in your stream. So it makes writing web service connections pretty, pretty straightforward. So the other thing that, we, that I really found um, maintaining the, uh, the D7 module is that regardless of how much documentation you write or how you sort of talk to people about the architecture of things, people always ask you for more and more documentation. And the reason is is because they don't want documentation. Um, they want simple examples and they want tutorials. Uh, people need to get pretty desperate and frustrated with something before they read the documentation for it. So asking for documentation is not, not necessarily, pointing them at the documentation isn't actually helpful. Uh, they, they really need specific examples uh, and, and a bunch of different ways of doing sort of similar things so they can understand how things work. People are very, I uh, want to say visual, but they, people, people learn how things work by watching them work, not by sort of describing it. All right, so that's sort of my basic, what I wanted to do, porting this module. So what did I, and I, I did all those things. Uh, so what did I learn porting a module to Drupal 8, or this particular module for, to Drupal 8? So uh, the thing that I learned is everything that um, 
Adam Bernstein said in his presentation was very true. You really do need to start from scratch. What's given to you as a developer in D8 uh, is completely different. Uh, I am very impressed that they managed to make the uh, site building interface in D8 and D7 look so similar because what powers it is completely different. It is just, it is a completely different architecture. Um, doing a real, setting up real planning and architecture and sitting down to think about these things in D8 really, really pays off. These are some of my early, really ugly sketches of how I was going to set up the different components and what those components were going to be. Um, WS calls and WS servers were going to be configuration entities. Uh, I did some experiments to figure out what kind of entities should they be. Um, went with configuration entities and then, that, then WS connectors and parsers were going to be sort of we're going to be plugins, uh, and so it really working with with Drupal 8. Uh, it was really beneficial to do this first. Get an architecture for what these objects are going to be. Uh, figure that out. Make sure it all makes sense, and then go and try and try and build them. Um, uh, Drupal console. Drupal console is a really neat tool. Most of what it does is code generation for things. Uh, it will create new, uh, new entity types for you, and new configuration entity types, and new content entity types, and new plugin types, and it'll set up all the little files for you. Um, I was really worried about using it because I felt like, oh, if I use this code generator, I'm not going to learn anything. It's just going to do it for me. Um, but Drupal Console is really not a silver bullet like that. Uh, it is really, really useful to get you bootstrapped with your objects. So once you have your architecture done, I went to Drupal Console and built a whole layer of where I, what I wanted the module to do. But it didn't sort of do anything yet at that point other than register all these objects in Drupal and give me some basic UIs, which would have been kind of a pain to set up. Um, and in the end, I ended up having to essentially touch every file Drupal Console generated for me. Uh, and put in code or change things or essentially nudge things, at the least nudge things back and forth in a certain way. So I, I had to go through it anyway, go through all these files anyway, so I did have to learn all the things it did. So um, it was actually a, a really useful tool to get started on. Um, you would probably have a lot of trouble with it if you skipped your architecture step and just wanted to code something uh, because it makes you decide the kind of thing you want first. But if you do architect, um, it ends up integrating nicely with that. Uh, so the other thing, the plugin system in Drupal 8, I really, really like, and I really understand why they used everything in Drupal 8 is kind of a plugin when you get down to the core of it. Um, it, it regardless of how you feel about annotations, um, you could also YAML annotate them to, to load them in. The plugin system is a really great way of adding stuff uh, to Drupal 8 and registering it. Um, and with Drupal Console, setting up custom plugin types um, is, really, is really easy and really fits in with sort of the object-oriented model uh, that Drupal 8 provides. So if you're going to have an object that sort of does something, and that something could be generic anyways, it's almost worth making it a plugin because then anybody could sort of write a plugin that does whatever it is slightly differently and then just use that instead. So it's worth it's definitely working worth looking into. Um, something else is use the coder module frequently. Uh, the coding standard well, the coding standard for Drupal 8 is different than Drupal 7 because most of the things architecturally are very different. Um, but uh, the coding standard actually changed while I was porting this module so slightly, so that was, that was fun. Um, and for a while, I just kind of left it because it was changing and then went back to doing the coding standard on it and had a whole lot of issues that I kind of had to resolve. Um, so instead of waiting to the end, uh, definitely run code or the coding standard checks uh, frequently. They end up finding a lot of stuff that you wouldn't 
uh, that are not coding standard necessarily violations, but sort of interesting things like, oh, you have this variable that you use only once, so it probably doesn't do anything. Um, finds your debug code and things like that. Uh, and the coding module also comes with another coding standard called Drupal Practice. Um, and Drupal Practice goes through your code and tries to evaluate whether you've done things in the best practice way. Uh, the one that really comes up, came up a lot for me is that it didn't like that I was calling Drupal services directly. It says, you should be using a dependency injection for this. And so I was like, oh man, I have to figure out how to use dependency injection on this particular item because I know how to use it here. But it, it, it actually made me learn like what are the, the there are base classes that handle dependency injection for you in Drupal core, so you can just inherit from them and then it's really trivial, trivial to add dependency injection to custom stuff. So it's actually worth following everything in Drupal practice and, and making it do that. Yeah, like I said there, it does a good job of training you to do things the right way. <laughs> So this is a problem that I ran into. Uh, Drupal 8 tries to cache everything it can, everything that, uh, that you do by default, which is kind of a change from Drupal 7. Drupal 7 sort of page cache things, but like Drupal 8 caches every piece you do and tries to do it by default. I was running into this strange exception. I had when I was writing the form that lets you test the web service, because. Um, what it would do is call the, the call method, which would say, hey, somebody's clicked the call button, make a call to this web service, and put the result on the page. So it would try and do a form rebuild, or tell Drupal to rebuild the form so it could put the result on the, on the page. Um, and then the form cache would throw an exception and the whole thing would die. And it's like, but this happens outside of my code. What is going on? And the problem is, is I'm jamming uncacheable things into a form that the form is then trying to, and the form's not, the like cached itself and then tries to cache itself again, and it already existed, and so it's causing this exception. Um, but really my problem was I just needed to tell the form that this form does uncacheable things, don't try and cache it. And the form has a method that says disable cache. I just needed to call that and it would work. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind, it's something I ran into in, when recording things to DA. Um, the other thing that I started, I sort of touched on before in my own stuff, but really started on with this and now do for all of my architecture, uh, is there's a language called plant UML. I'm not sure how many people here know, remember their UML. Um, but there's, there's a language called plant UML that is just a text-based language, sort of symbolic, kind of like Raft is, but way, way easier to use. Um, and it renders in UML, different kinds of UML diagrams. Uh, it makes building you like diagrams for things trivial, and then you can commit them to source. It is really, really worth learning um, and implementing for your projects. That's how I did the, 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 the component diagram in the previous slide and how I did this uh, sequence diagram, which, described, which is part of the documentation I'm including with the module. So if somebody really wants to dive into the documentation, they'll be like, wow, look at all these graphs. Who wrote this? Um, but uh, it, it's actually a sort of really, really good way of getting their thoughts down about how these things should work and how these things are connected. Uh, and you can put it down into code, and it makes pretty pictures for you that you can show off. Um, this sequence, sequence die, diagram was essentially what happens when you call um, call in a, a call method on the service. So it goes to service and on and on and on. I won't go through the whole thing. But uh, yes, Plant UML is a really great tool. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll show you what some Plant UML looks like if you're interested. So it uh, essentially, for basic, yes, I got you, you're wearing cookies. Let's zoom in. <laughs> okay. 
There we are. Here is some plant UML. You start with start UML, and then point Alex goes to Bob, Bob goes to something else, and it is really, really straightforward. You can code like really fast sequence diagrams, or uh, any other U class diagrams, or state diagrams, or component diagrams. Um, and it makes having it makes having really fancy documentation easy. All right, yeah. So the other thing I found too is that services were pretty useful while writing different things. Uh, I use a lot of different services that are, are exposed by Drupal Core and write my own and expose my own service. Um, they they're actually um, a re they're actually a really useful tool in terms of exposing functionality to, to users, um, and it it really does let you sort of fourth people down a certain path that you want uh, for that functionality, because uh, you can sort of block access to other stuff and be like, no, 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 if you're gonna use this functionality, like call this function explicitly, and then you can make sure that all of your validation follows the specific path. In D7, you're generally creating a whole bunch of these global functions, and then if you didn't want people to call them, you'd start them with an underscore. Um, but if, so, if you're writing an API, People are going to be looking at those functions and they might call them directly if they want to do something specific, but that could get them in trouble in other ways that they might not be aware of. But this lets you really provide more of a complete interface to expose. All right, so what was the result of all this? So status, there's an alpha 2, which I tagged and tried to create last night. Uh, but uh, Drupal.org was not seeing my tag for whatever reason. Uh, but then that was, yeah, I wasn't going to fight that for that long. Uh, where we are now is the core components sort of all work. Um, but the integration components need to be written. I want to write integration components with Drupal Console so that you can automatically have Drupal Console generate the shells of all the plugins for you. Um, the WS Data for D7 has a whole bunch of Drush commands, um, so you can script deployments. So if you deploy to this environment, it will sort of disable these web services so that if some, something calls them, it just will return false immediately, um, which makes sense for certain environments that don't have access to certain stuff, or, or you don't want um, your dev environment to be able to access your email service or something like that. Um, it can also change the endpoints with Drush. So it lets you script a whole bunch of things to deployment that isn't there for the VA. Um, the field controller, field storage controller, doesn't doesn't exist yet, but it's written. Um, the thing I, I also want to add is more rules integration. There isn't rules in, uh, integration in D7, which I should probably write. Um, but it would be pretty cool to have in rules to be like, when this happens, make this web service call and, uh, and trigger something else. And then you can essentially have Drupal push data to other services. Um, and then sort of general block Im implementation. So you can have a block that es essentially you say, this block renders the result of this web service. And you could have a block that just you stick on the side of something that loads something about it. So it gets some context and loads, let's say, the, a Wikipedia article that's similar. So that's what I, I need to still write. So all the good stuff that doesn't exist. All right, so we can take a look at, a quick look at that and hopefully it works. No, it should work. All right, so same thing, it's, it's under structure. Uh, except now it's a web service server. Uh, here's the uh, the Wikipedia connector, very similar. Uh, except now things are simple, more a lot more simplified. Uh, just have its name, it tells you the machine name, what the base endpoint is, uh, and then because it's easier to write connectors, uh, I've, and because Drupal comes with uh, an HTTP client, it's going to come packaged with a lot more connectors. So you guys probably can't read that. There we are. Uh, the pre in the in the uh, 
777 version, it only came with a REST connector because it was really designed around making RESTful, the full REST support, like CRUD calls to field, for the field storage. Um, but that isn't what most people, including us, ended up using it for. The bit, most of the use case was just making simple HTTP calls that you wanted to configure. Um, it turns out that even in the RESTful world, uh, every single web service is implemented completely differently. Uh, so you need to be as flexible as possible because uh, there's, there's web service standardization even in a web service standard kind of doesn't exist. So the more you can configure the better. Uh, so I still left the rest of the in there which isn't actually very good now. Um, you can also set it to a local file directly. So it'll load file, it'll get files from the file system and you can interact with them. Uh, instead, or just a simple HTTP connector. And then simplified again our WS calls. So you can, you, it has its own machine name uh, and, uh, and what its label is. Uh, you can pick what server you want to use for it. Uh, it'll look at the server and then generate the rest of the form to uh, give you the options for that. What what kind of connector that that one is connected with. If you choose local file, it'll just say, what's the file name um, that you want to interact with? But this one says, what's the path and what meth HTTP method you want to use to call it? Um, how you want to decode the results. So in this case, I'm going to use the XML decoder. And then how I want to encode data I send to this. I just don't want to do anything, so it'll pass strings as is. Uh, and then you can test it. And because of the way this, so this just tests it and runs it like this. Um, so this is the, the XML that's returned. So. the code for this. Hold on a second. Sorry guys. Actually, let's just go to the slide. There we are. Better developer API. live code. I mean, of course it doesn't work. Anyways, instead of trying to debug why um, my, my PHP eval doesn't work, we're just going to move on. But uh, yeah, so this is a simplified version of D8 and what the D8 version looks like. Oops. Go here. Playing with fire. Indeed. <laughs> Alright, and, uh, and that's it. So, are there, uh, are there any questions? Hey. I got a kind of a big one. Sure. Um, so I understand that AAA thing, they re architected as services, so they're very internally focused. Would you say that in the future, that they would be, as you've done, focused, like the core team would be focused on integrating with outside web services? Or would we all have to adopt OES services and they would see that, oh, Every, all the developers are, you know, the community aspect of all the developers are jumping on this. And, like, how does this functionality get to the core? Because you, you talk about so, caching issues and stuff like that, but the core would kind of have to understand stuff. Yeah. So, what Drupal, like, is for the, like, at its core is, is a content management system. Yes. And everything in Drupal is really about. I'm the content management system, and I'm the only content management system here, so any data I interact with is mine. I know the data model, so I can offer things like views. Um, but it's my data, 
Like, I know when I change my data, my data won't be changed another way. Uh, and that's why you can get into such big trouble and get such weird side effects if you go and edit the database, like uh, content in the database directly. Uh, you can make weird stuff happen because uh, Drupal sort of depends on you going through its data flows to alter the data because it does things like clear certain caches when it knows data has been updated. And if you circumvent that, um, it, it gets angry at you. Uh, or you just you run into bugs. Um, so really, like that's what Drupal sort of, how Drupal thinks and what its goal is. And uh, WS Data lets you do something kind of tangential to that. So I would never see this functionality as something that would go to Drupal core. Um, this is definitely like a contrib thing. This is, what if you want to make Drupal play with sort of things that you're not managing, content you're not managing, uh, and integrate that with your content management system, um, which really sort of leaves the scope of a content management system. Yeah, you can see where my decision tree is going uh, architecturally, like is Drupal the front end, you know, or for a large corporation, you have many different services that are already being built across the corporation. What's the front end of that? Is that Drupal, a Drupal website consuming those yeah. services? Or is Drupal just one of those web services and, a, and, and a something else being the front end is consuming all those services? But if you're going to look at it like this, yeah. then this is essentially the reverse of headless Drupal. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and you wouldn't do that, that's crazy, because Drupal's your content management system and the rendering system is not necessarily the part of Drupal you really like and want to keep. Yeah. Um, but, so it's really just used for extra, extra data. Um, so you could do both. If you wanted to have sort of a headless Drupal instance and write something in React that loaded data from, like loaded a specific sort of object of data that to render, uh, but in your back end, that object could be composed of multiple pieces of data from different places, but most of it is in Drupal. Uh, you could use this to sort of make those objects that Drupal's presenting to your uh, React front end be like one consistent object as opposed to having your React engine have to talk to things and then assemble it itself. So that would be the, the, the use case in that if I think I get your question. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Hey. Um, what architecturally, of course, you're thinking of use cases, but one of our approaches for remote data in the past has been leveraging some solar cores to yeah. index something, and I guess there's pros and cons, um, evidently, to that. Uh, it looks like you can tap into this being a node in the end, so you could do other things yeah. around that web service call, where I guess if you're just presenting solar remote data, then it's not always a node, so yeah. I guess there's a big evaluation criteria there. Have, has this potentially work with CMS, or is there any scenarios around documents? I'm just concerned about performance sometimes. I guess it's the use case. It's, it's really it's really the use case. This is really so you can use it with anything and, and customize it. I mean, you kind of end up in caveat emptor territory when you need performance. Um, so when you're generally doing things with solar, you end up with, with different problems. Uh, well, not different problems, but you end up in a different place because solar prevents presents a really standardized thing. Um, and if you know the people who are indexing data in there, you can get like a data model out of them that's pretty standard. Um, and so you can do cool stuff with solar integration. Um, and a lot of modules do that, like with Sarnia and, um, well, Search API and things like that. But if you look at the way that those modules work, uh, Search API, Apache Solar, Sarnia, they're all about uh, most of the work you have to do is to explain the data model of the data in solar to Drupal. And that's all your work. You tell Drupal about the data model, where certain things are and where they go. Uh, and then what they provide is an interface to make the solar queries um, provide using that data model to get the data they want and sort of how Drupal goes in the interface between the data model you provided and, and Drupal. Um, so WS Data lets you skip that step by sort of being like, uh, well, you know what the data model is, so just configure web services to do that. And we won't ask you to tell, explain your data model to Drupal so that Drupal can, uh, can uh, expose it to all these internal tools. This is just sort of 
plug in what you want your actual calls to be. Uh, we don't care about the data model, we'll just give away for Drupal to load this data. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's really where this sort of fits in. You can turn on, no, you can turn on, I guess, commenting and rating on nodes now because you're in Drupal, I guess. Yeah. So that, it makes me think of some of the stuff they went through with open data. Yes, yeah. So this would be sort of another, another way of, of doing this, the similar things to what they did in open data. Um, the, so the benefit there is because they're only talking to one place, they can, they can really get benefits from taking the time to meticulously explain Drupal, to Drupal what the data model is and how to get all these components and how to interact with them and how to query them and how to query different components. Um, and WS Data assumes that you're not going to do that and so uh, it's going to be limiting in other ways and freeing in different ways. Run a hybrid. So, yeah, you could absolutely do that. Um, here, go over there. Uh, yeah, just as a follow-up to that, there's a module specifically for search API that lets you um, view data that was in that folder via some other process. Um, so if that's your specific use case, I think. Yeah, so that's the sign your module, right? Uh, no, search API sort of data is something. <laughs> oh, there's more of them. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so sort of, it, it really depends what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, when you start getting into this kind of territory, things get complicated enough where it's worth like looking at these modules. Um, yeah, like if, if you're going to express to Drupal what your data model is, uh, well, I could start talking forever about sort of <laughs> these modules. But uh, you really have to look at the benefits of like like what are you trying to gain? Like if you're trying to expose your data model that you have in a remote engine to Drupal so that you can make one view, like maybe don't do that and just get the data and render it out the old fashioned way like everybody, everybody else does not that aren't using Drupal and don't have to use. So like you sort of, you have to really evaluate your requirements, what you're trying to build, like what's going to be cheapest and easiest and easiest to maintain for your team and that kind of thing. Um, it's complicated enough where you can't be like, this is the right solution to these problems. Because, yeah, it, it, gets, it gets really complicated really fast. Technical debt. Yeah, exactly. Oh, what's up? Um, yeah, so kind of a segue to this question. They talk about the data that you use external entities. Yeah. And if I understand what you're saying, is like you would be using external entities really when you have very structured data in a specific way, and this is more free flowing. So it's not, it's not even that, because you could have self-structured data and prefer this over external entities, it's what are you going to do with them now that they're entities? So you've got these external entities. Like, what are you trying to leverage in Drupal? How did they, making them entities make your life any easier? Because great, they're entities, but they still aren't doing anything. Um, so what was so great about making them entities? And there are some great things about making them entities. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to disparage entities. Um, like, it, but any of these come with this baggage uh, and functionality, and you sort of have to look at that. Like, is this what I like? Do I need this functionality, um, and can I live with this baggage? Uh, and depending on your use case, sometimes you can. Sometimes, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it isn't. Um, and you know, when you're doing your architecture planning, that's when you make these decisions. Okay. Hey. Can you tell us a bit about views? About views integration, I sure can. So views is an interesting beast. Uh, views is really where people misunderstand the data model behind things, because that's what essentially a view lets you do is build a SQL query. Um, oh, who doesn't like that? Uh, I stopped oops. recording. It stopped recording. Yeah, this is, oh, well, whatever. Um, so, let's talk, so views really lets you change, I don't know how much time I have either, so flag me if you guys want to escape. Because um, Views builds a, a SQL query to select a certain number of things. So you can get in trouble uh, if you want to filter by something that's remote. Uh, because what, how do you do that? Um, so you've got a SQL query that gets you everything, and then you then widow down afterwards, and then, then paginate. Um, or what if you want to filter by something that is in the data, by a property that's in the database and something that's remote? Uh, 
So views, views is a very tricky thing. Uh, and the implementations that do views well force you to only use one data source. So if you're looking at uh, the standard views, it will build you a SQL query, and that's how you're doing the filter. Um, if you're looking at search API views, it will build you a solar query, and that's how you're doing your filtering. And you can't sort of mix and match things. If you want to filter more, then you've got to index it in solar. Um, and same thing if you're using like a EFQ views, then you're restricted to using your entity field query to do your filtering. Uh, so there is views integration for this, but it is very, it's, there is, it's, it's sort of rudimentary because it'll just show fields and let you sort for them, through them and filter them, but can only filter by the results that are returned from the database. Uh, the way that we solve this problem in WSA is because of the nature of when this data is loaded on entity load, just use search API, so, or just use search API. So index everything, make a view on that index, uh, and then all of a sudden everything works. Because from the node view point, from the, when the loaded nodes point of view, these aren't database fields or remote fields, it's just data in the entity. So if you're indexing the entity, uh, you can index that to source, and everything just sort of magically works with you. Any other questions? Or I think it's getting pretty late. Anyways, if you have any questions, please come talk to me. And yeah, thank you very much.